my name is Louis Scharf. I graduated three times from electrical engineering here at the University of Washington, all three times in the 60s. It's great to be back here, terrific to be back here for these Lytle lectures. In 2006, at the uh, electrical engineering centennial celebration, a few of Dean Lytle's students announced their intention to endow uh, an endowed lecture series in the name of Professor Dean W. Lytle. And it, it was actually a tribute uh, to him as a mentor of a great number of masters and PhD students at the University of Washington. But it was also actually a tribute to that entire generation of colleagues of Dean Lytle, uh, people I had the pleasure of taking classes from, people who were dedicated to our well-being and dedicated to their profession. In our efforts, we were joined by a great number of Dean's former students, by the Lytle family, by his colleagues from electrical engineering, and by a great number of his colleagues from Honeywell's Marine Systems Center, where he served as a consultant for many years. I speak on behalf of all the donors for this endowed lectureship series when I thank Les Atlas and the Electrical Engineering Department and the College of Engineering for the way they've embraced this lectureship series. Um, and with that, I'll turn the podium over to Les, who I think has an important uh, introduction to make. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. First, what I want, I want to say what an honor it is for me to be asked to just speak as in, to introduce this event, which is indeed a celebration. Electrical Engineering Department at the University of Washington has, for its over 100-year history, grown to be one of the best departments in the country. To earn that reputation, we have made sure our graduates have had substantial impact as future engineering and academic leaders. Our late professor, Dean Lytle, and I must add, Professor Louis Scharf, who we just heard from, and others in this room have been key for this top reputation. We have also interacted with our visitors, who while not UW faculty, have been able to influence us through their worldwide leadership and inspiring seminars. And our speaker today is at the top of that worldwide list. Our 2012 Lytle Lecturer is a James B. Duke Professor of Mathematics at Duke University, Professor Ingrid Dubshees. Professor Dubshees is, um, is in, a, in the math department, yet has had tremendous impact in electrical engineering and our own field of signal processing. She's also had impact in physics, computer science, medicine, and as we will see shortly, art. Among her many awards, Professor Dubshees has received a Mar MacArthur Fellowship in 1992, National Academy of Sciences Award in Mathematics in 2000, the Benjamin Franklin Award for Electrical Engineering, and just recently, the 2011 Jack S. Kilby Medal from the IEEE Signal Processing Society. She holds honorary doctorates as a member of national academies in several countries, and was elected to the U.S. National Academy in Sciences in 1998. She is presently serving a four-year term as president of the International Mathematical Union. Professor Dubshi's talk today, which illustrates the range of her impact, is titled, Can Image Analysis Detect the Hand of Master? Wavelets and Applications to the Analysis of Art Paintings. Let's give a hand to Professor Dubshi's. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk to you today. Uh, so I want to tell you something about uh, wavelets and uh, their mathematical properties, uh, and then really illustrate all that when painting analysis. And a number of people today already asked me about it, and I've tried to not, not, not uh, divulge the whole story yet. So, OK, wavelets. Um, this is going to be, we're going to go very fast over this because for those of you who are in signal processing, it's going to be baby talk. But, uh, so uh, digital images consist of pixels, and you, if we think of an 8-bit image, 
then they are uh, they have 256 gray values going from zero black to 255 white. Uh, so imagine, I mean, to illustrate that, let's imagine here already a digitized uh, painting, a portrait uh, by Van Gogh, and uh, I uh, have blown it up until certainly those at the front rows, maybe not the back rows, you can really see the individual pixels. And if we take one row out of that, uh, you see here the individual numbers. And I'm going to show to you a very, I'm going to illustrate a very naive wavelet transform so that those of you who don't know about wavelets get a feel for what we're talking about. So you should imagine it happening all over the image, but I'm going to illustrate it only on this tiny little bit of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of the painting. So um, what, I'm what you notice already here is that many of these pixel values, these gray values, in which I have put some in bold to remind you that those are darker than the higher numbers next to them, many of them are very similar to their neighbors. And that's because in many images, whether they're natural images or like in this case, digitized versions of paintings, uh, pixels are very similar to their neighbors. I mean, it's not a big jumble of all different pixels. I mean, there are groups of darker ones and groups of lighter ones and transitions between the two, which are edges. So uh, if you take that into account by uh, looking at, uh, for every pair, the average, then you already have captured quite a bit of the information. And even with these averages, of whom you have only twice as, uh, half as many, uh, you have that they're very similar to their neighbors, and so, again, I can take their averages. Uh, I have, of course, in making these transitions, lost some information, and that information is completely encoded in the differences for each pair of numbers, and I'm computing those here at the two levels at which I looked. And the essence of the wavelet transform is that most of these differences are very small, except a few and those indicate where you had a sudden transition in the image. So that was in one dimension. So let's do it in two. So in two dimensions, I really have a two-dimensional array of these numbers. And I can, on this, in two dimensions now, make my transform. So I have to compute. First, I'm going to do row by row averages for each pair. And here, and of course, I mean, everybody knows that the average of 121 and 122 is not 120.5. It was an honest mistake, but I decided to leave it in just to show that mathematicians make lots of arithmet arithmetic mistakes. <laughs> uh, so I take these averages for every row, and that gives me these two arrays, one of averages, one of differences. But I've done it all horizontally. Vertically, I've done nothing. So I have to do the same thing vertically, but on these two species of arrays. So each of them is going to give rise to averaging and different arrays. So in total, I'm going to have now four arrays. And I keep doing that, and I have all my numbers. Uh, these numbers correspond to different types of features in the image. If you imagine in your original image having horizontal bars, dark bars and light bars, then the horizontal averaging is going to maintain that. I'm going to have low number bars averaged and low and high number bars, low number, high. And then when I take a vertical differencing, I'm going to get a big number. So big number in this array here, in which I have averaged horizontally and differenced vertically, will indicate presence of horizontal bars. Here, I have differenced horizontally and then averaged vertically. So if I had vertical bars, that would have given me big numbers, big positive numbers, and big negative numbers, big positive, big negative. And the same on the row below. So if I average them, I maintain that. So large numbers in this little array here show that uh, the second little red array show that I have vertical features. And then differencing and differencing is really something that, that is more associated with diagonals. But I have a, the fourth array was averaged in both directions. And just like I did in one dimension, I'm going to repeat the whole transform and compute averages and differences. And those will give me that same type of information at a coarser scale. So what I have done here is I've replaced that four by four square by one global average and then all this detail information. So let's see this. Um, 
a real image. I have here this uh, boat image. If I average it horizontally and vertically, it will not surprise you that I get a copy of the original image. Fine. Now, if differencing horizontally and averaging vertically, I said was going to give me uh, large numbers for the vertical features. And indeed, I get things that differ from middle gray. Ah, yes, because I took differences, I now can have negative numbers too. So I started with 0 to 255. Now I take differences, I go from negative 255 to 255, so I have to change my allocation of color. Middle gray will now be zero, and one extreme will be black and the other extreme white, and the black extreme shows up more readily in this display. So that's how you get middle gray, because all those numbers are very close to zero, except where you have vertical features. And then after I have differenced vertically, but averaged and differenced horizontally, I get the horizontal features and the diagonal features. But you see that in this a rendering here in these three different uh, coefficients, uh, rectangles, I have mostly middle gray. And then I have to repeat that next scale, averaged, and then the three types of differences. Now, that was the information that was in that first level generation averaging. I have to add to that the generation of the first generation of differencing of wavelet coefficients in order to have everything. Now, again, I'll repeat this information I replace by this, and then in order to get the complete information for the image, I have to add the other two layers. And I repeat again, and again. So this is a wavelet transform of the original image. Now, what does it mean? Okay, so let's show what the meaning is of the successive approximations. Here, I'm showing you, I mean, since I can always go back, I can always reconstruct. I'm showing to you reconstruction of what I get if I only take the very core scale approximation. None of that detailed stuff. And you get this very fuzzy rendition of the boats. It shows you already that I have actually uh, cheated a little bit. I'm not taking just averages of pairs. I'm really doing something more sophisticated. I'm using here the wavelets that are part of the JPEG 2000 standards, which make everything a bit smoother. It corrects the average with a couple of the neighbors and so on. But so, morally speaking, it's still the same thing, and I have a coarse version of the image. And as I add in detail, you see the image gains, indeed, in detail. Now, let's examine that again. I'm going to look at two areas on my picture. I mean, one area in the sky and one on the sail. Here they are in their coarsest approximation. And People at the front, probably at the back you won't see it, but at the front you will see that on the right in the sky, it is a little bit more washed out in the approximation than in the original. But after I add one scale to it, I'm virtually perfect. I mean, just look at the sky, don't look at what happens at the bottom. You see, I, all these, these different details don't add much. If we go back and we now look at the sail, it's obvious that there, we need all that extra detail in order to make things sharp. So what this has illustrated is that I really need the fine scale wavelet coefficients only there where I have sharp edges. Where I have something smooth, I don't need them. And that's a reflection of a mathematical property of wavelets, that if you have something that is smooth in places and has sharp edges in other places, that in the smooth places, you only need the wavelet coefficients locally there decay very fast as you go to fine scale, and so you don't need those fine scales. But you need them where you have fine scale information. Now, you can use that for compression. So this was my original decomposition, and uh, to illustrate the mathematical property that is uh, at play, I'm going to give you a reconstruction from only a sum of those coefficients, which I will tint in red here on the right, and the, reconstru the reconstruction I get from that is the one on the left. So let me toggle back and forth so that you see what I'm missing in the image as I go to the, uh, uh, the reconstruction. It's a reconstruction that uses about 1 30th of the original uh, data only. So 1 30th of the coefficients have been put to zero in order to make that reconstruction. Since my image was an 8-bit image, that means that uh, I needed 32 bits for every two by two square. So if I had been very stupid, 
uh, then I could have said for every two by two square whether it was mostly dark or mostly light and put it, painted it white or black. And that would be the amount of bits I need in order to make this much better reconstruction on the left. Now, caveat. First of all, uh, what I've done here is really just paint things, I mean, thrown away coefficients, and I've kept the other ones with their full precision. Of course, that in principle takes a, a large number of bits for each of these coefficients. In practice, you would never do that. I mean, electrical engineers are much smarter than that, and they do a bit allocation, and they, they, they allocate different numbers of bits to different types of coefficients. Second, I also am completely neglecting the fact that after I paint them red, I have to tell you where these red things were. I mean, if I just send you that 1 30th of the information, I mean, there's no way you can reconstruct those boats. And so the overhead is important here as well. And so the mathematical insight that fast decay of wavelets in smooth parts can be used for a, uh, a, a good compression uh, has to be paired with smart coding techniques. And actually, I uh, wrote a paper with uh, colleagues in, in electrical engineering that we call on, um, on the importance of combining mathematical theorems with smart electrical engineering coding yeah, for image compression. Now, if I used a few more, the ones here in green, then you get an image that is virtually perfect. But it is important, and that's the reason why Wavelets actually made it in the JPEG 2000 standard. At 10%, almost z zillions of methods can do very well. But it's the, the graceful degradation. If you go coarser and coarser and coarser, how the image slowly loses its, its uh, uh, precision. OK, also, uh, Wavelets have this, 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 this localized feature. So imagine, and this is just a complete toy illustration with, with my boat image of a situation where you imagine that there are very large databases somewhere from which you want over a low uh, 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 channel or low bandwidth line uh, retrieve detailed information but on only part of the images. You could think of a medical application, you could think of several possible applications. Then what you can do is recognize in the coarse scale image what the region is that you want. You transmit those coordinates and the database will use that to paint red only those coefficients you want and send you those. And as you put that in, you see how you can rec reconstruct sharply a piece of the image and not waste any bandwidth on the rest. So, painting. What we want to do is, in our images, in these paintings, uh, use the wavelet decomposition to study those images. So let's take, again, an example of Van Gogh. I'll tell you later why I'm so obstinate about Van Gogh in these examples. Uh, one way in which you can see the averaging is to just blur. I mean, that's a, a, a way in which you can say, look, I'm, I'm blurring, and look at the difference. The difference between the image and the blurred version is this thing on the right that you don't see at all. So if we amplify it by a, a factor 100, you start seeing that indeed you see the edges in the original image. I mean, this is actually, uh, this, uh, just an aside, this part of the presentation was something that I put together because we were talking with art historians and even though I didn't show a single mathematical equation, what I was showing you earlier was not going to be of interest to them. I had to actually explain this idea of different approximations without going to averages and differences and so on. So I thought about doing this with the blur. So let's imagine doing this at, uh, uh, with a, short, a small little piece and blow up so that we see more clearly what happens. We blur, blur further, and blur further. We look at the differences in which false color has been added. And now, these are these three differences. Uh, something that is striking, I mean, and this illustrates how we can, from these wavelet uh, analyses things, try to extract properties of the image. We see, for instance, edges in these, these images. And an edge is something, if you think of something, something that goes from dark to light with a sharp edge. That looks like that, whether you look at it closely or far. I mean, it's a sharp edge. 
So you find it in all these scale things. But there are other regions, like the region that I've highlighted here with a little purple square, in which you see virtually nothing at the finest scale and very little at the coarsest scale, but there is something, I mean, here I'm blowing it up, at the intermediate scale. So these are details that are not very sharp. They don't exist at a very fine scale. They emerge, but then again, at coarsest scales, they don't exist anymore. So you can actually characterize what goes on in the image by things that emerge at certain scales, disappear, they live at certain scales or live in a certain range of scales, things that live at all scales and those are typically edges and so on. So you can, by studying how things present themselves in your image, characterize uh, their behavior. So let me tell you now how, how, why all these Van Gogh examples. It really, this is, and, and, and how I started working on, on art work. It really started with um, uh, Rick Johnson, Rick Johnson from Cornell, who spent a year on sabbatical in uh, the Netherlands. Now, he had always been interested in art, and he took the opportunity to uh, get to know people at, in the uh, conservation department of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And uh, he remarked to them, he said, look, you, look, you, you use input from uh, many different sciences in studying the artworks. You use x-rays, you use uh, infrared photography, you use if a little flake of paint falls off, you, you make a chemical analysis and so on. You use all those things. Um, but you don't seem to use image analysis at all. And I said, well, image analysis, I mean, we, we use x-rays because we can't see with x-ray eyes, but we have our eyes, we see. I mean, why do we need image analysis? And he said, well, um, if you let me have, he says, I can do it because I'm, he, he, he typically works on 1D uh, uh, signals, not on 2D. He says, but I know people who work on image analysis. If you let me ha give them data uh, under non-disclosure agreements, then I can arrange that they come and give a workshop on the results that they find. And you can see whether you find it useful or not. And so, indeed, because they had this personal connection with him and they trusted him, they let him... Uh, make it possible for us to have access to data. I mean, we had to sign uh, uh, agreements by means of which our soul would be for feet forever if, if it leaked, and, and, uh, but uh, I, I still have my soul. Um, we, we didn't leak anything. I mean, you see, because museums are typically very, very, uh, uh, very careful with the digital presentation of their images. They actually have photographs of all these paintings. I mean, when, they, when you get a digitization of a painting by Van Gogh, it's not that they took it off the wall and slammed it on the scanner and scanned it for us. I mean, they have photographs of these, which they scanned. And, but they, uh, so these photographs they've had in their archives, I mean, and these photographs get retaken regularly, uh, are used for art books or for other projects, and they really don't like to share them uh, uh, widely because that is part of their revenue right there. So anyway, so they gave us a, a database which had paintings by Van Gogh, and one of the things they asked us whether we could use uh, wavelet analysis to um, distinguish paintings by Van Gogh from paintings that at some point had been attributed to Van Gogh but weren't. So among those, there were some paintings by friends of his because, well, sometimes he had a painter friend and they said, oh, I like that painting, oh, well, let's swap. I mean, that way. So there were paintings that were in his possession at the moment he died, which then were attributed to him and later they found that, no, they were of some friends of his. There were other paintings of, uh, by people who had influenced him, who he admired. Uh, and then there were paintings by uh, people who had forged Van Gogh's. So um, let me try to see. Actually, we didn't test out whether this movie was going to work, so we'll have to see. Okay, yes. So here, what we did with these paintings is we analyzed the wave analysis of little patches. We then characterize the content of these, these, these uh, paintings by looking at what level of details emerged or, or disappeared or remained around. We made little feature vectors for each patch that way, and we would then compare different patches by looking at distances between feature vectors. 
we would make a distance for the big paintings by combining all the distances between patches in one with the, dist and, uh, by, by, with the patches in the other. So we now had a huge uh, uh, matrix that for each two paintings in the collection gave us a number, a distance according to our metric. And we then could try to find the best way of embedding that distance uh, matrix into 3D. We made it into a big mobile and we made that mobile rotate in order to visualize it for our art historians. And the paintings here that are indicated in red are the paintings that were not by Van Gogh. And you see they are by and large pretty far from the center. So they are near the edge of the cloud. Um, and they were very happy with that, but there's one painting that is not by Van Gogh on which we did the least well, which is this one here, as it comes by. And that is a forgery. That is a forgery that was painted in the, the 30s. Uh, 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 it was commissioned by uh, an art dealer called Wacker, who, uh, who by, by miracle found a whole lot of Van Goghs that were earlier not known. And uh, I mean, so this made a big scandal. And, and uh, um, so the fact that we did not uh, detect the, the, the forgery, uh, I mean, showed us that on the one hand, we were capturing style pretty well, but that people could try to forge the style and we were not seeing that. Uh, things that are near the, the outside are, for instance, although this is a genuine Van Gogh, this uh, thing that was inspired by a Japanese woodcut, or this naked study. I mean, people who don't really know their Van Goghs by heart, by now we're pretty good about recognizing Van Goghs because we've stared at many, would not recognize these as typical Van Goghs because they aren't typical and so it's not so surprising they lie outside the whole style. But so indeed we found that we could uh, uh, recognize different artists from Van Gogh, but uh, we were not so good on paintings that imitated his style. Um, now, another thing that happened with this workshop that the Van Gogh Museum uh, uh, in, uh, had in uh, uh, the very first IP4AI, image processing for art investigation workshop, uh, was that NOVA got hold uh, of, uh, heard about it, and thought this might make some interesting television. And so they asked us beforehand whether we would be willing to examine a data set that we would get a week before the workshop, which would give us uh, a, a data set with five paintings by Van Gogh that we hadn't seen yet, and a sixth painting that would be a copy of Van Gogh, and whether we would be willing to bet that we could recognize the copy from the originals. And we said, sure, I mean, uh, copy. But also, I mean, thinking, look, it's interesting science. I mean, if we can't do it, then it will teach us something as well. And, uh, but as I said, in our style analysis, we found we couldn't detect that, that, that copy. And we then uh, remembered that we had read in a paper by a, a, a computer scientist in the Netherlands, uh, who had looked at Van Gogh's, and here you have at the left that Wacker copy and the other three, and he said, when I take a wavelet transform of all these images, the copies, the forgeries, seem to have more wavelets. I mean, it, it seemed a bit strange to say that, but remember, when we did the wavelet transform, most of the coefficients, actually three quarters of all the numbers you compute are the fine scale wavelet coefficients, and then you have three quarters of what remains are the next scale and so on. So a lot of wavelet coefficients is only possible if you have a lot at the very fine scales. And so we said, well, maybe we have to look at the very fine scales. And indeed, that is, that, that's how the, the Wacker copy had been uh, detected. And we then had some theory for that. We said, look, if you try to imitate somebody's style, it's not your natural style, you will probably be a little slower in painting it, a little bit more hesitant, I mean, was our theory. So, um, and that will show you much more fine scale detail. Let me show you that here. So here I'm showing you another painting and very, very fine scale detail. 
of that painting. Now this painting is, you'll see it later, the original. This is uh, the detail of, at, at the scale at which it's projecting, and the painting here goes way beyond the hallway, uh, although the painting itself in reality is only this big. Uh, so what you're seeing here is really enormous enlargement of brush strokes, and what I'm talking about is this kind of, of, of wobble on the brush stroke. And so we could indeed, by means of that analysis, so when the Van Gogh when the Nova Challenge showed us the six paintings, indeed we, and not only we, all the image analysis teams who were there detected that this little reaper was a copy and the others ones were original. And so Nova shot this and actually they made a whole uh, hullabaloo about it. We, they had the, the, the painter walk into the room, uh, the, the young woman who had done the painting. Oh, a little aside here. Nova had what wanted to have the painting done by somebody who in recent years actually had been, uh, I mean, he, he, he set out his prison uh, 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 term and he's free again, but I mean, he had been arrested for being involved in the forgery of Van Gogh's and the museum said, no way. I mean, <laughs> we do not want to be featured in, and so, so they proposed instead an, uh, an art history student who uh, was then still a student, she now has finished, it was an expert at uh, art reconstruction and art restoration and she painted a copy of this. And so Nova had this little snippet of film, and you can still find it on the web, uh, where uh, uh, she walks in with the painting and she, with the box, and they open the box, and they say, what number did you all say? And we all repeated the number, and they open it, and there is indeed the painting we identified. And we say, oh, wow. And uh, one of my students was there, and I turn around, and I give her a high five, because we used to do it, and they loved that. So we had to do that four times over spontaneously again. <laughs> For uh, anyway, so uh, okay, so we've talked about fine scale. Now, the Van Gogh Museum said um, that's all very nice. I mean, nice television, but let's do a little bit more scholarly work about this, please. Um, we have, they said, in our collection, we have a painting that we like a lot, and that is a copy of a Van Gogh. Uh, we like it because it was painted not long after his death by somebody who had acquired some of his paintings and by somebody who had much more money and so who could afford better paints. And this is a portrait of, of, of some, some uh, young girls in a garden and uh, in the copy there's some pink in their dresses and in the original it looks all white and that's because Van Gogh bought a cheap red, cheap vermilion that doesn't uh, that 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 uh, doesn't hold its color over time, and so the Van Gogh Museum was very interested because this more expensive vermilion showed them what the painting had looked like. I mean, if you think of the Van Goghs you've seen, you can you probably haven't don't remember many pinks. Well, whatever pinks they were have gone. That's why no more pinks. Uh, anyway, so that was a copy, and they know it's a copy, and they, but they treasure it for another reason. They said, but since it's a copy, you should be able to see that it's a copy. And so we say, sure, of course. So they send us, but they also had other tasks for us, and they send us uh, some new paintings, 21 new paintings to our data set, and they all come out hesitant. I mean, all have this feature that we think that they're copies. And we knew some of them were absolutely authenticated, uh, whole, uh, I mean, paper trail, I mean, it was without a doubt that some of these were really original. So. We ask some of the other group and we say, we have a problem. I mean, like, what do you find? I said, we too. So we then started asking what's going on here. Turned out that how did we get these digital things? Well, Eric Postma, who is in the confidence of the, of, the, of the Van Gogh Museum, actually had made these digitizations and he got them because he got the photographs, the original photographs that they had and he had scanned those. And he had recently bought a new scanner. And so the 21 that we got had been scanned on the new scanner. So, and indeed they may, were much crisper. And here you see two examples, an old one and a new one. And I mean, indeed, you have much more crisp detail with new ones. But that made us realize how vulnerable we were to all the different stages in the acquisition process. And so we said, well, let's be scholarly. Maybe we should reassess everything. I mean, so yes, they take these photographs and then they scan them and so on. 
And we, uh, we decided that we would try, based on the data set we had, to assess how blurry they were. And there, is, uh, 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 there are papers in the literature that uh, show that since in, in becoming blurry, uh, edges, T's, corners, and so get affected in different ways, you can use that to sharpen up your image. And this is actually used by some digital cameras. So we could, just based on the copies we had, try to assess how blurry they were. And if we did that, we, we defined our own scale, and we had a blurry index, zero, not blurry at all, one, the highest blurriness we had in our data set, then we found that when we looked again at the pictures from the NOVA test, the picture that we had identified as the copy was by far the least blurry because the photograph was more recent and had been, uh, and so had, was sharper and scanned. Actually, we could find all kinds of things. I mean, the paintings also came from two different museums and we could find that on average, the photographer in one museum was a little bit better than the one in the other museum because we found a significant difference in blurriness there. But I mean, this meant, this what I'm showing you here was that I'm shown on the internet high-fiving a student over a complete piece of fraud. <laughs> because yes, we had detected this one was different. It was sharper. It was not, we, but fortunately, uh, so, we had also thought ourselves of making a different test. I mean, uh, we had asked Charlotte Caspers, who here you see at work um, doing this. This is in the basement of my previous house. You see my son's drum set in the, in the, in the corner and, and so on. So we had asked her, uh, uh, she was still a student then, so I paid her ticket and, and some pocket money for three weeks. And so, so she spent half the time visiting the museums in New York and the other half making our data set in my basement. Um, we, she painted original paintings from some of the tchotchkes in my house and uh, then painted copies of those same paintings. So with the same material, the same artist, not long after the original was painted, she painted those copies. She kept also very, uh, 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 she had kept a diary of what she was doing and uh, a, an original painting would take her 20 to 25 minutes. A copy would take her something like 45 to 50 minutes. So it really was about double the time. And so we felt that indeed, this, the idea that we had it, that it was more painstaking, might leave a trace. She was convinced we would not see anything. She says, look, I'm doing this, it's the same person. I mean, it's just a few days after I've done the original, for heaven's sake. I mean. And, uh, but she, she, she really did try to make these painstaking copies. And so I now have a whole collection of, uh, uh, I mean, here you see some, but there were many more. I have seven pairs of paintings. Uh, uh, we, we, we intend actually to make a little exhibit at, at Duke talking about the art and about the, 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 the science that went into analyzing them. Uh, and uh, they were all done with different materials and different, some were done with, uh, uh, and different styles. So here, the one with the rooster was done in the style of the Flemish primitives uh, on, on, on chalk ground, on, on wood. Uh, some were done on very coarse uh, uh, fabric, others on, on, on nicely uh, grounded fabric. And uh, what we found, I mean, and there were data set where we knew what the originals were or not. So we did our analysis again, and uh, with our feature vectors, and we did several different tests, I mean, cross-validating and also making sure that we were not comparing patches that were identical. So we wanted to mimic with our limited data set the idea of having originals and copies, but not necessarily of the same painting. So we would take some patches in one image and then a patch of a different location in the other image so that we would not have cross-information. And what we found is that uh, we could distinguish reliably, and this test has since been repeated by a completely different method by a group in France, uh, the paintings that she had, the originals from the copies, whenever she had used both soft and hard brushes. So uh, to go back to the examples here, the bottom one and the dragon on the left, of which earlier when I was showing you brush stroke things, you saw a little corner here, 
I mean, and you've seen this painting is only this big, so you can imagine the blow up we saw earlier. Um, so for those two, for instance, we could detect it. For the one on, on, on the right, which was painted with only very fine and soft brushes, we couldn't. But still, I mean, Charlotte herself was really surprised that we could do it. Uh, but that actually was the beginning of all this work on art, and we are now uh, looking at, at many other projects. So, because we gave talks about it, and people also came to these workshops, we got more interesting questions. And that actually was the whole goal. I mean, to learn what ways could people who work on image analysis be uh, doing useful things for art historians. So, one person who contacted us was uh, uh, called Joris Dick, who is a, uh, a chemical uh, engineer slash art historian in Delft. He analyzed this little study by Van Gogh, painted in its Paris per period, which is called un polotje gras, which means a little patch of grass. And uh, underneath that, uh, with uh, x-rays, this, there was something else. So there was a portrait of a woman, so this had been known before, uh, that this was there. Uh, it was of interest, this painting was, although Van Gogh had a period in the Netherlands where he lived with his parents, where he painted many, many portraits of peasants under very poor light conditions. I mean, the potato eaters is of that period. Because he was experimenting with how he could convey color if there was almost no light. I mean, how would he do that in his palette? And uh, this was of particular interest to art historians because there's a letter of him that survives that, uh, to his brother in Paris. says, uh, I think I'm sending you a picture in which I think that I really achieved what I'm aiming for. And um, we be people believe that it's this painting over which he painted something else. Once he was in Paris, his method changed, his whole vision changed of how to, so he probably didn't value this painting so much anymore and he painted over it. Actually, about 30% of the Van Gogh paintings have something else underneath because he was poor and he reused canvas. I mean, so, uh, but so since he said that he achieved what he thought he wanted to achieve, it sounds particularly interesting. So recently, um, with fluorescence, uh, uh, X-ray fluorescence methods, it became possible to actually penetrate better underneath these painted layers and get more information of what was underneath there. So Joris Dick had done this on this particular painting. So this is in antimony, uh, which is a component of Naples yellow, and they had found this. They had also looked at uh, arsine, which is a component of uh, vermilion, and they found this. So, uh, which is already much more detail than what you got in this x-ray picture. So, this is what they got, but you can see here there were all kinds of artifacts in these images. Uh, one artifact is that you have these big black blobs. Uh, that's because in the original painting, you have these big blobs where he put flowers with impasto technique, and so it was harder to penetrate those little clods of, of paint, and so they give you these black blobs. But something else is that this X-ray fluorescence technique was done pixel by pixel. And it was done, I mean, this was the first painting in which this was done, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in a hospital in Amsterdam, because they used the X-ray source that came from uh, uh, a synchrotron uh, in a hospital where it was used for medicinal purposes. And they, uh, they had, the beam was not used all the time. And so when the beam was not used, they could, they could have it in order. And so the painting would move pixel by pixel. But from time to time, after all, this thing was there not for analyzing paintings, but to produce uh, uh, short life uh, uh, radioactive isotopes. And so from time to time, they had a patient who needed to, uh, so then they didn't have the beam, and so then the whole thing had to stop until they had the beam back again. And they had some synchronization problems. And the result of that is that you see here, for instance, you see these lines that are shifted. It's because they didn't stop in time, or they stopped too late, or I mean, whatever. And, uh, and since they zigzagged, that gives these, these patterns. Now, there they're very visible, but in fact, they're all over. I mean, uh, about uh, a quarter of the places you have a synchronization problem. So the first thing, uh, so they asked us, look, we have this problem. We'd like to clean this up. 
can you help us with that? And so we, we did a mathematical, I mean, we first found a nice variational uh, analysis in order to re reduce all these, these synchronization problems and we brought it back and we could then do that on the different paintings together, so uh, on the different views. The next thing was we uh, wanted to remove those blobs, so we marked them and then did in-painting on them, used in-painting techniques. Uh, we, we did that again on all the traces of the grass uh, stalks and we in-painted. And uh, then finally, we were still not very good with the eyes here. And we said, well, what shall we do? The eyes are not so good. Then uh, somebody who from the conservation department says, oh, we have that all the time. You just use the other eye then to correct. <laughs> so, okay, so we did that. So now we have the, the thing on the left here, which was a much cleaner version to show you the in-painting. Here is a blob on the nose and how it was in-painted. And you see how it is a very gradual in-painting. Well, you all know what in-painting can do in good image analysis. Okay, so this picture actually, uh, four years, of four, four or five years ago, you had Googled uh, uh, Van Gogh portrait woman. Uh, uh, you would have one third of the pictures would have gone would be this. This was the cover of a chemical engineering uh, a journal that, that featured this, this discovery by Joris Dick and Kuhn Janssen. And what they had done is they had taken the original and they had used the antimony one to put some yellow in and then uh, they had also corrected some things by hand. They put a little bit of vermilion where the arsine showed up and so on, and this was the colorization they got. Um, we, so this was what they try, wanted us to do better then. We used the portraits that uh, Van Gogh painted in that same period, and uh, two extremes, one with a very uh, low dynamic range, one with extreme contrast, and we found actually, I'm going to go through this, but we found that once you looked at the chromance map and you discount the places where it's very dark, the two chromance maps actually are quite similar. And so we then said, well, we can use that information in order to propose a number of different interpolations for the, uh, the portrait that we had reconstructed. And Joris Dick took this to a conference with museum conservators, and uh, they chose this version as the one. So we went from the version on the left to the version on the right. I mean, just using lots of image analysis and uh, techniques and extrapolation. So um, let me mention one further project. So, this is something that I presented at, so as I said, these workshops go on. Every 18 months we have another one. We had one uh, about six months ago, but this is one that, not that last one, but the one before that. So it's about two years ago that I presented this result. And this is a, um, this is work on a completely different period. We're now talking about a 16th century painting. Gossen van der Weyden is a Flemish painter of the early 16th century who is the grandson of his much more famous grandfather, Rogier van der Weyden, who was one of the top painters of that period. But he was plenty famous in his own right. He had a Lark's workshop and he had many different apprentices. Now, it's very common for people in that period to have apprentices. It's very common also for the apprentices to paint part of the paintings that were commissioned from their masters. And this is well known and nobody had a problem with it. We know because there are some uh, lawsuits that are preserved where somebody says, look, I bought this painting from the master and I know not, it's customary that it's not all, this case I believe none of it was done by the master and so then we, we don't accept. So you can establish customs from there. So. Um, as was customary, paintings were painted on, uh, worked on by several students. Um, in these paintings, in many, many cases, we find underdrawings, and those can be found by infrared reflectometry. And uh, you see them here, I mean, these lines on the painting, and you see here some shading. You see them especially where the painter changed his mind. 
So you have a nose here that was bigger than it eventually became, things like that. So where the painter changed his mind, you see a line underneath there that doesn't correspond to the surface. And so you can uh, see the underdrawings that way. Now, Holsten van der Weyden had very many different styles in his underdrawings. So, um, and people had noticed this uh, uh, before. I mean, so for instance, these are complete, two different, complete sty uh, different styles of underpainting, and uh, I'm going to show you the different classes. So one class of underpainting, the art historians classified as little parallel lines indicating of shading, like you would do shading in a woodcut. So a second class was also fine lines, but now curved, like the ones here on the throat of this lady to indicate volume. I mean, show that. A third style, he said, like on this one, that are kind of sketchy to indicate a, 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 a sketch. And then a fourth time, I mean, this is not even a sketch. This is like saying, look, I mean, I want a face and I want the eyes about here and some and a mouth and then some curly hair. I mean, it's not even, not even a cartoon. It's just a shorthand for what you want there. And these are completely different. And um, what he asked is, originally people thought that these different underdrawing styles showed an evolution of the painter. I mean, in the beginning, he was less sure, he would, and so on. And then later, just a little shorthand was enough for him to complete the painting. But then they found them within the same painting. I mean, clearly, they were not paintings over which he had taken 20 years. So, uh, uh, so then they said, maybe it has to do with who had to finish that part of the painting. Maybe if he was going to do it himself, a little shorthand was enough. But if uh, an apprentice was going to do it, he had to draw in things more clearly or indicate volume or indicate uh, 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 shading. Or, uh. And so since we could detect copies from originals or different hands in a painting by looking at very fine details, he asked us, could we, from the painting surface, classify in classes that would correspond to different underdrawings? So again, we used wavelet analysis to do this with hidden mark of models, feature models, and so on. So anyway, uh, so we indeed, this was our, our data set. We had these different paintings and we saw this before. We saw the portion of, of the body of Christ. We saw the, the, the grieving virgin. I mean, so for these, we had both the underpainting and, and so on. And so we went through learning. Uh, we went, this was a supervised learning and we felt we did good classification. And we did uh, the, the uh, take one out classification and we found that we had very good results uh, for, for uh, um, but I mean, it's one thing to say we have very good results because techniques that people use in, in machine learning take one out uh, validation and so on. And another to convince them by being able to do it on a blind data set. I mean, so I said, why don't you send us a blind data set? Because this was clearly going to be. So uh, Maximilian Martens, who is the uh, uh, art historian we worked with, sent us these uh, 10 unlabeled paintings. And we do our analysis. And uh, we worked finally with a machine learning algorithm that would give us the probability to be in the different classes. And so we have these four classes, and we decide the probability. We had decided ahead of time that we would consider it success if the right one was in the top two classes that we found. And so I mark here the top two classes in bright and darker red. And we then got the answers from, uh, the true answers from Max. And we were pretty happy. I mean, except in one case, we were completely off, but otherwise we were always in the top third. And we were quite often actually at the, uh, when we were, when we had very big numbers, we, we, like the 96 and the 82, we were bang on. But there was this one that was really bad. And so I called Max and he says, oh, he says, this is fantastic. This means you can even make it work for an other painter. I said, other painter? Yes, he says, I sent you a few that were from another painter. I said, Max, you can't do this. I mean, this was not, <laughs> this was not the test. Uh, he says, oh. So I said, let me, tell me, 
because I was hoping, of course, the six would go away, but we removed the ones that were not, and it hadn't gone away. And I said, but what has gone on there? I mean, how is this possible? Look at this one. It's just a completely, not only are we not right there, but it's the lowest probability. And you tell us it's class one. And then I asked Max, I said, Max, can I please get the underdrawing? So here it tells us which ones are good and so on. And this was the underdrawing for that. I said, Max, come on. I mean, if I had to classify that underdrawing, I wouldn't say these are little parallel lines indicating woodcuts. I mean, I would say that this is a kind of sketch of, of, of something. I mean, you could even say it is a very loose thing with these curly lines here. So I would say it's three or four, which is what our algorithm found. And Max said, yes, I know, he said. I threw that one in to, to see whether you really could find it. <laughs> so he took this blind data set really, really seriously. But on the other hand, that was very convincing. So now we're in the process of actually, uh, in, for this data set, uh, 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 since he's less famous than, uh, than, than Rogier van der Weyden, most of the paintings remained in Belgium, and Max Martens knows where they all are because he's an expert on this guy. And so we're going to have his whole oeuvre and all the underpaintings. We also are hoping to maybe find a technique to detect the underpainting uh, automatically from the infrared. So uh, even in places where it coincides with edges of the, the top painting. Uh, so there's plenty of things still going on. We have another project on uh, Van Eyck, the very famous altarpiece in, in Ghent, where with virtual crack removal, we have made it possible for uh, art historians to read more words of a book that is, of course, I mean, Van Eyck was a, a real uh, 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 obsessive uh, uh, perfectionist. I mean, so there's a book that is rendered so this big on the thing, and he has little words in there, which he must have painted with just one hair on it. On, on, and, and so people wanted to see was this, had he just done as if, or was he trying to really paint the words? And now the consensus is that apparently he really tried to paint the words. They have tried to identify the text that he was painting. Um, but that was possible because we did this crack removal. We have done other stuff on helping people prepare a restoration campaign by removing virtually some artifacts and, and, and so on. So there's lots and lots and lots of stuff that image processing can help. And, uh, and, and I think this is a field that is really starting to grow. And if you want to have the special test talk about it, you should ask Shannon Hughes, I mean, who's at the University of Colorado. So, thank you.